Introduction The Meta Metapatriarchal Journey of Exorcism and Ecstasy All mother goddesses spin and weave. Everything that is comes out of them. They weave the world tapestry out of genesis and demise, threads appearing and disappearing rhythmically. Helen Diner, Mothers and Amazons this book is about the journey of women becoming, that is, radical feminism. The voyage is described and roughly chartered here. I say roughly by way of understatement and pun. We do not know exactly what is on the other side until we arrive there, and the journey is rough. The charting done here is based on some knowledge from the past, upon present experience, and upon hopes for the future. These three sources are inseparable, intertwined, radical feminist consciousness spirals in all directions, discovering the past, creating, disclosing the present future. The radical being of women is very much an other world journey. It is both discovery and creation of a world other than patriarchy. Patriarchy appears to be everywhere. Even outer space and the future have been colonized. As a rule, even the more imaginative science fiction writers, allegedly the most foretelling futurists, cannot, will not, create a space and time in which women get far beyond the role of space stewardess. Nor does this colonization sim exist simply outside women's minds, securely fastened into institutions we can physically leave behind. Rather, it is also internalized, festering inside women's heads, even feminist heads. The journey, then, involves exorcism of the internalized godfather in his various manifestation. His name is Legion. It involves dangerous encounters with these demons. Within the Christian tradition, particularly in medieval times, evil spirits have sometimes been associated with the seven deadly sins, both as personifications and as causes. A standard listing of the sins is the following, pride, avarice, anger, lust, gluttony, envy, sloth. The feminist voyage discloses that these have all been radically misnamed, that is, inadequately and inadequately understood. They are particularized expressions of the overall use of evil to victimize women. Our journey involves confrontations with the demonic manifestations of evil. Why has it seemed appropriate in this culture that the plot of a popular book and film, The Exorcist, this was written in the 70s, centers around a Jesuit who exorcises a little girl who is possessed? Why is there no book or film about a woman who exorcises a Jesuit? From a radical feminist perspective, it is clear that father is precisely the one who cannot exorcise, for he is allied with and identified with the possessor. The fact that he is himself possessed should not be women's essential concern. It is a mistake to see men as pity pitiable victims or vessels to be saved through female self-sacrifice. However possessed males may be within patriarchy, it is their order. It is they who feed on women's stolen energy. It is a trap to imagine that women should save men from the dynamics of demonic possession. And to attempt this is to fall deeper into the pit of patriarchal possession. It is women ourselves who will have to expel the father from ourselves, becoming our own exorcists. Within a culture possessed by the myth of feminine evil, the naming, describing, and theorizing about good and evil has constituted a maze haze of deception. The journey of women becoming is breaking through this maze, springing into free space, which is an amazing process. Breaking through the male maze is both exorcism and ecstasy. It is spinning through and beyond the father's foreground, which is the arena of games. This spinning involves encountering the demons who block the various thresholds as we move through gateway after gateway into the deepest chambers of our homeland, which is the background of ourselves. As Denise Connors has pointed out, the background is the realm of the wild reality of women's selves. Objectification and alienation takes place when we are locked into the male-centered, monodimensional foreground. Thus, the monitors of the foreground, the male mythmasters, fashion prominent and eminently forgettable images of women in their art, literature, and mass media, images intended to mold women for male purposes. 
The background into which feminist journeying spins is the wild realm of hags and crones. It is hagocracy. The demons who attempt to block the gateways to the deep spaces of this realm often take ghostly, ghastly forms comparable to noxious gases not noticeable by ordinary sense perception. Each time we move into deeper space, these numbing, ghostly gases work to paralyze us, to trap us, so that we will be unable to move further. Each time we succeed in overcoming their numbing effect, more dormant senses come alive. Our inner eyes open, our inner ears become unblocked. We are strengthened to move through the next gateway and the next. This movement inward outward is being. It is spinning cosmic tapestries. It is spinning and whirling into the background. The spinning process requires seeking out the sources of the ghostly gases that have seeped into the deep chambers of our minds. The way back to reality is to destroy our perceptions of it, said Bergson. Yes, but these deceptive perceptions were or are implanted through language. The all-pervasive language of myth, conveyed overtly and subliminally through religion, great art, literature, the dogmas of professionalism, the media, grammar. Indeed, deception is embedded in the very texture of the words we use, and here is where our exorcism can begin. Thus, for example, the word spinster is commonly used as a deprecating term, but it can only function this way when apprehended exclusively on a superficial, superficial foreground level. It's deep meaning, which has receded into the background for so long that we have to spin deeply in order to retrieve it, is clear and strong. A woman whose occupation it is to spin. There is no reason to limit the meaning of this rich and cosmic verb. A woman whose occupation is to spin participates in the whirling movement of creation. She who has chosen herself, who defines herself by choice, neither in relation to children nor to men who is self-identified, is a spinster, a whirling dervish, spinning in a new time space. Another example is the term glamour, whose first definition, as given in Merriam-Webster, is a magic spell. Remember the craft? That was from the 90s. Originally, it was believed that witches possessed the power of glamour. And according to the authors of the um, Malleus Maleficar, I can never say this word, Malleus Maleficarum, I didn't take Latin. Witches by their glamour could cause the male member to disappear. In modern usage, this meaning has almost disappeared into the background. And the power of the term is masked and suffocated by such foreground images as those associated with Glamour magazine. Journeying is multidimensional. The various meanings and images conjured up by the word are not sharply distinguishable. We can think of mystical journeys, quests, adventurous travel, advancement in skills, and physical and intellectual prowess. So also the barriers are multiple and intertwined. These barriers are not mere immobile blocks, but are more like deceptive tongues that prevent us from hearing ourselves as they babble incessantly in the Tower of Babel, which is the erection of phallocracy. <laughs> Mary Daly's funny. The voices and the silences of Babel pierce all of our senses. They are the invasive extensions of the enemy of women's hearing, dreaming, creating. Babel is said to be derived from an Assyrian Babylonian word meaning gate of God. When women break through this multiple barrier composed of deceptions ejaculated by God, we can begin to glimpse the true gateways to our depths, which are the gates of the goddesses. Spencers can find our way back to reality by destroying the false perceptions of it inflicted upon us by the language and myths of Babel. We must learn to dispel the language of phallocracy, which keeps us under the spell of brokenness. This spell splits our perceptions of ourselves and of the cosmos overtly and subliminally. Journeying into our background will mean recognizing that both the spirit and the matter presented to us in the Father's foreground are reifications, condensations. They are not really opposites, for they have much in common. Both are dead, inert. 
This is unmasked when we begin to see through patriarchal language. Thus, the Latin term texere, meaning to weave, is the origin and root both for textile and for text. It is important for women to note the irony in this split of meanings. For our process of cosmic weaving has been stunted and minimized to the level of the manufacture and maintenance of textiles. While there is nothing demeaning about this occupation in itself, this limitation of women to the realm of distaff has mutilated and condensed our divine right of creative weaving to the darning of socks. If we look at the term text in contrast to textile, we see that this represents the other side of the schizoid condensations of weaving spinning. Texts are the kingdom of males. They are the realm of the reified word of condensed spirit. In patriarchal tradition, sewing and spinning are for girls, books are for boys. Small wonder that many women feel repugnance for the realm of the distaff, which has literally been the sweatshop and prison of female bodies and spirits. Small wonder that many women have seen the male kingdom of text as an appealing escape from the tomb town of textiles, which has symbolized the confinement reduction of female energy. We should not forget that countless women's lives have been consumed in the sweatshops of textile manufacturers and garment makers, as well as in the everyday tedium of sewing, mending, laundering, and ironing. The kingdom of male authored text has appeared to be the ideal realm to be reached, entered, for we have been educated to forget that professional knowledge is our stolen process. As Andrea Collard remarked in the Society of Cops and Robbers, we learn to forget that the cops are the robbers, that they rob us of everything, our myths, our energy, our divinity, ourselves. Women's minds have been mutilated and muted to such a state that Free spirit has been branded into them as a brand name for girdles and broads rather than as a name for our verbing, being selves. Such brand names brand women, morons. Moronized women believe that male written texts, biblical, literary, medical, legal, scientific, are true. Thus manipulated, women become eager for acceptance as docile tokens mouthing male texts, employing technology for male ends, accepting male fabrications as the true texture of reality. Mary Daly is a genius. Patriarchy has stolen our cosmos and returned it in the form of Cosmopolitan Magazine and Cosmetics. They have made up our cosmos ourselves. Spinning deeper into the background is courageous, sinning against the sins of the fathers. As our senses become more alive, we can see, hear, feel how we have been tricked by their texts. We begin unweaving our winding sheets. The process of exorcism of peeling off the layers of mind bendings and cosmetics and third wave feminism is movement past the patriarchal patriarchically imposed sense of reality and identity. This demystification process, amazing the lies, is ecstasy. Journey journeying centerward is self-centering movement in all directions. It erases implanted pseudo-dichotomies between the self and other reality, while it unmasks the unreality of both self and world as those are portrayed betrayed in the language of the father's foreground. Adrian Rich has written, in bringing the light of critical thinking to bear on her subject in the very act of becoming more conscious of her situation in the world, a woman may feel herself coming deeper than ever into touch with her unconscious and with her body. Moving into the background center is not navel gazing. It is being in the world. The foreground fathers offer dual decoys labeled thought and action, which distract from the reality both of deep knowing and of external action. There is no authentic separation possible. The journeying is itself participation in paradise. This word, which is said to be from the Iranian pari, meaning around, and deza, meaning wall, is commonly used to conjure an image of a walled-in pleasure garden. 
patriarchal paradise is projected in Western and Eastern religious mythology is imaged as a place or a state in which the souls of the righteous after death enjoy eternal bliss, that is, heaven. Despite theological attempts to make this seem lively, the image is one of stagnation in a stag nation. As suggested in the expression, the afterlife, in contrast to this, this paradise, which is cosmic spinning, is not containment within walls. Rather, it is movement that is not containable, weaving around and past walls, leaving them in the past. It moves into the background, which is the moving center of the self, enabling the self to act outwardly in the cosmos after as she comes alive. This metapatriarchal movement is not afterlife, but living now, discovering life. A primary definition of paradise is pleasure park. The walls of the patriarchal pleasure park represent the condition of being perpetually parked, locked into the parking lot of the past, a basic meaning of park is a game preserve. The father's foreground is precisely this, an arena where the wildness of nature and of women's cells is domesticated, preserved. It is the place for the preservation of females who are the fair game of the fathers, that they may be served to those predatory park owners and service them at their pleasure. Patriarchal, patriarchal paradise is the arena of games, the place where the pleas of women are silenced, where the law is please the patrons women who break through the imprisoning walls of the playboys playground are entering the process which is our happening happiness since our pa passage into this process requires making breaks in the walls it means setting free the fair game breaking the rules of the games breaking the names of the games breaking through the foreground which is the playboys playground means letting out the bunnies, the bitches, the beavers, the squirrels, the chicks, the pussycats, the cows, the nags, the foxy ladies, the old bats and biddies, so they can at last begin naming themselves. I have coined the term metapatriarchal to describe the journey because the prefix meta has multiple meanings. It incorporates the idea of post-patriarchal for it means occurring later. It puts patriarchy in the past without denying its walls, ruins, and demons are still around. Since meta also means situated behind, it suggests that the direction of the journey is into the background. Another meaning of this prefix is change in, transfer, transformation of. This, of course, suggests the transforming power of the journey. By this, I do not mean that women's movement reforms patriarchy, but that it transforms ourselves. Since meta means beyond transcending, it contains a built-in corrective to reductive notions of mere reformism. This metapatriarchal process of encountering the unknown involves also a continual con conversion of the previously unknown into the familiar. Since the unknown is stolen, hidden, knowing, frozen and stored by an abominable snowman of androcratic academia, spinsters must melt these masses of knowledge with the fire of female fury. Amazon expeditions into the male-controlled fields are necessary in order to leave the father's calves and live in the sun. A crucial problem for us has been to learn how to repossess righteously while avoiding being caught too long in the caves. In universities and in all of the professions, the omnipresent poisonous gases gradually stifle women's minds and spirits. Those who carry out the necessary expeditions run the risk of shrinking into the mold of the mystified Athena, the twice-born who forgets and denies her mother and sisters because she has forgotten her original self. Reborn from Zeus, she becomes daddy's girl, the mutant her serves, who serves her master's purposes. The token woman who in reality is enchained, possessed, knows that she is free. <clears throat> she is a useful term, tool for the patriarchs, particularly against her sister Artemis, who knows better, respects herself, bonds with her sisters, and refuses to sell her freedom, her original birthright, for a mess of respectability. Amazing Amazons must be aware of the male methods of mystification. Elsewhere, I have discussed four methods which are essential to the games of the fathers. This is fucking important. First, 
There is erasure of women. The massacre of millions of women as witches is erased in patriarchal scholarship. Second, there is reversal. Adam gives birth to Eve, Zeus to Athena, in patriarchal myth. Third, there is false polarization. Male-identified feminism is set up against male-defined sexism in the patriarchal media. Fourth, there is divide and conquer. Token women are trained to kill off feminists in patriarchal professions. As we move further on the meta-patriarchal journey, we find deeper and deeper layers of these demonic patterns embedded in the culture and implanted in our souls. Again, just repeating, these methods are erasure of women, reversals, false polarization, and divide and conquer. These constitute mind bendings comparable to the foot bindings which mutilated millions of Chinese women for a thousand years, stripping away layer after layer of these mind bending societal mental embeds is the amazing essential to the journey. Spinsters are not only amazing Amazons cutting away layers of deception, spinsters are also survivors. We must survive, not merely in, a, in the sense of living on, but in the sense of living beyond. Surviving from the Latin super plus vivere, I take to mean living above, through, around the obstacles thrown in our paths. This is hardly the dead living on of possessed tokens. The process of survivors is meta-living being. I'm gonna stop there for the introduction. There's more in the introduction. We'll get to it. <laughs>